This is Jack Jackson, and we're back with our third in our set of videos where we're going to be talking about using algebraic techniques and the laws of limits to figure out how to compute certain kinds of limits. Um, so sometimes when we this we get things that we want to find the limit of, and they have indeterminate forms, and that's why we need to use these different techniques. For, so for example, this one right here, in example six, if we just try to plug in x equals zero, which is kind of a good thing to start with, we can see what happens. Well, first of all, as soon as you plug in this very first part, you get one over zero. So we know the whole thing is undefined at zero. But what about a limit? Well, if we plug in zero in this part, we also get one over zero. One over zero minus one over zero is equivalent to one over zero. It's kind of like infinity or minus infinity. So one over zero is kind of like infinity. So this is like infinity minus infinity or one over zero minus one over zero. Either way you think of that, that's what we call an indeterminate form. It's like zero divided by zero. Just on the face of that, this may not have a limit uh, or it might have a limit, but if it has a limit, it could be anything. So just on the face of this, we can't we really don't have a clue of what the limit is at this point. We have to do some sort of further manipulation. And the manipulation we're going to do right here is this technique of finding a common denominator and combining the fractions, adding them into a single fraction, and then we'll be able to use some of our techniques that we've looked at earlier. Okay, so when we add two fractions, what we want to do is we want to get a common denominator first and then we keep that common denominator and just add the numerators. Now to get a common denominator it needs to be a common multiple of the two original denominators. Usually we'd rather prefer the least common denominator. So to do that we're going to, to find that we're going to factor the denominators first. x is a single factor by itself. x squared plus x is x times x plus 1. So now we can see that our common denominator must have an x in it and must have a, a, an x plus 1 as factors. So the second fraction is basically just fine like it is. The first one, however, we need to multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing to get the denominator to be this common denominator. So we multiply the top and bottom by x plus 1. Now we see that the denominators are the same, so we can keep the denominators and add the numerators. Of course, 1 times x plus 1 is x plus 1. And so the numerator now becomes x plus 1 minus that 1. So it's x plus 1 minus 1 over that common denominator of x times x plus 1. Well, now we can just do some basic simplification here. 1 minus 1, of course, is 0. 0 plus x is x. And now we can use our technique we learned earlier that as long as x is not 0, we can cancel these x's. Of course, notice x is not 0. It's only approaching 0. And so the x's do cancel out, and this is equivalent for x's that are not equal to 0, this fraction is equivalent to 1 over x plus 1. Now this particular fraction uh, without the x there is actually continuous at x equals 0. So we can work it out by just plugging in the x equals 0. We're actually using the limit laws now where you're saying that the limit of the fraction is the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. Limit of the numerator, limit of 1 is 1. Limit of the denominator is the sum of the two limits, limit of x is x goes to 0, 0, limit of 1 is 1. So we're actually applying uh, some limit laws. Uh, I didn't write out all the steps right there, but we're applying some limit laws going from here to here by just being able to plug that in. And of course, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 divided by 1 is 1, so the entire limit is 1. Now we should be able to verify this with the graph. So if we were to graph this, let y equal 1 over x minus 1 over x squared plus x. Be sure you put parentheses around the denominator here in the second part. Then you're going to get a graph that looks like this, and according to this limit, this says that the point 0 for x and 1 for y should be a hole in the graph or a removable discontinuity, and you can see it right there on the graph when I graph this in the uh, program Graphmatica. Okay, let's look at another example, another technique. So the next technique we're going to look at is multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. So in example here, let's look at this example. Example here, we have the limit as x goes to 2 of the square root of 4x plus 1 minus 3, that's the numerator, divided by x minus 2. So x minus 2 is the denominator. Notice that when we plug in x, uh, x equals 2, we get 2 minus 2 is 0 in the denominator. So we know this function is not defined at x equals 2, but it might have a limit. 
But look what happens when we plug in 2 in the numerator. 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9, square root of 9 is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0. We get 0 divided by 0. That is an indeterminate form. So again, that indeterminate form, 0 over 0, which shows up all over the place in calculus books, uh, that indeterminate form could, could give us a limit of, of anything, or it may not even have a limit. So we have to investigate further. Now we're going to make use of a couple special facts from algebra. One is this special product, that if you take this sum and difference pattern, a plus b times a minus b, when you multiply this together using the distributive property, or FOIL, uh, you get the square of the first minus the square of the last. The middle terms, a, b, and minus a, b, cancel each other out. And so you get a difference of two squares. This is going to be useful for us. So what we do here is, you know, this is like the square root of something minus something here. Okay, so what we do is we multiply by the other part. So the a is the square root of 4x plus 1. The b is 3. So here you have a minus b and a plus b. Now we can't just go around multiplying by things in the numerator unless we balance that by multiplying by the same thing in the denominator here. Now when we do this, that's, that's okay. As long as this thing that we're multiplying by is not 0, and remember x is not 2, it's only approaching 2. So for all other values, this is not 0, so that's okay. Now we're going to multiply this together. In the numerator, we're going to multiply this out using that sum and difference pattern. So we get square root of 4x plus 1 square minus 3 square. Of course, 3 square is 9, so it's minus 9 at the end. And here the square root and the square cancel, leaving us 4x plus 1. That's one of the things we want to do is get rid of that square root in the numerator. Now in the denominator, I could distribute this or something, but I'm going to leave it like this. It's probably easier just to leave it and not have to mess with the step of multiplying this out. So just leave the bottom like it is factored. Now in the numerator, we can simplify some more. 1 minus 9 is negative 8. By the way, when you're writing these, don't forget to keep writing your equals. Line them up and line up your limit signs here because the limit we're only going to take at the very end. In the meantime, we're going to be doing a lot of manipulation of algebra. So it turns out there's really basically just pretty much one uh, or two uh, calculus steps and a whole bunch of algebra steps here. Okay, so anyway, where were we? We, we said 4x plus 1 minus 9 is 4x minus 8. The denominator has stayed the same here several times. So in the numerator, I can factor out a 4 and leave that 4 times x minus 2 using the distributive property. And now notice that the x minus 2, since x is not 2, these are not 0. And so these will cancel out, and we get 4 over square root of 4x plus 1 plus 3. Of course, this function here, y, uh, f of x, uh, say g of x equals this function, and f of x equals the original, agree at all points except for x equals 2. So now we take that limit, but this function, which I just called g of x, the 4 over square root of 4x plus 1 plus 3, that is actually continuous at 2. We can actually plug in the 2. Again, now we're using limit law, several laws of limits here uh, going from this step to this. The limit of the quotient is the quotient limit, so you get the limit of the top is 4. Then you do the limit of the bottom, provided it exists and is not 0. We're good to go there. So the limit of the bottom is the limit of the sums is the sum of the limits. Limit of 3 is 3. The limit of the square roots, the square root of the limit here, and then you take the limit of each part. So we're using several properties of limits here, uh, but basically this is a continuous function, so we can just plug in the 2 here. Okay, let's see if we can work that out now. 4 times 2 is 8 plus 1 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. So you get 4 over 6. Of course, 4 is 2 times 2. 6 is 2 times 3. The 2's cancel, and 4, 6 reduces to 2 thirds. It does have a limit. So if we let y be this original function here, uh, square root of 4x plus 1 minus 3 over x minus 2, if you put this in your calculator, like say y1 and ti84, be sure you put parentheses around the numerator, be sure you put the parentheses around the 4x plus 1, be sure you put the parentheses around the x minus 2. Okay, and if you do that and graph it, we should see when x is 2, and y is 2 thirds, that should be a hole in the graph. And it is, I graphed it in Graphmatica, here's what the graph looks like. And right there where x is 2, you can see, and y is 2 is uh, two thirds, look at the scale. This goes from 0 
one's up here, this is a half. So this is 0 0.5, 0 0.6 repeating is 2 thirds. Yeah, that looks like about 2 thirds. So 2 2 thirds is our, is our limit point, which is a hole in the graph. The limit of the function there is that y value, 2 thirds. Okay, uh, here's another example. Why don't you do, do uh, this one on your own using the same technique that we just did? Now this time we're gonna we're gonna rationalize or we're gonna use that technique to fix the bottom instead of the top. Okay, so uh, work this one on yourself and then come back and check your work. Press pause now. Okay, hopefully you've worked this and come back. Well, the first thing you should have done is realize that if you plug in seven, uh, we get a zero over zero form. Let's see if that's true here. 3 times 7 is 21, minus 21 is 0 in the numerator. 7 plus 2 is 9, square root of 9 is 3, 3 minus 3 is 0 in the denominator. This is 0 over 0, an indeterminate form. So it is very much like the last one. And here we do have a sum or a difference of two things, one of which, uh, or it could be both in some cases, is a square root. We can use that sum and difference pattern. So what we want to do is take the denominator, 3 minus square root of two, x plus 2 and multiply by 3 plus the square root of x plus 2. So we have a, which is 3, minus b, which is square root of x plus 2, times a plus b. a minus b times a plus b. Now we can do that as long as we multiply the numerator by the same thing. Now in the, denom in the numerator, just leave it factored. In the, num in the denominator, I'm going to multiply this out using that special product, a minus b times a plus b is a squared minus b squared. So we get a difference. We start with the sum of difference pattern, we end up with a difference of two squares. Three squared is nine. The square root and the square cancel, leaving x minus two. We still got a minus here. So one of the peskiest things that uh, plagues students a lot with algebra is remembering to distribute these negatives when they're supposed to be there. So don't forget the parentheses here. So when we distribute the negative, that becomes a negative x and a, and a minus two. So 9 minus 2 is positive 7, so we get negative x plus 7. Now, this 3x minus 21, we can factor a 3 out of that and leave x minus 7. We can factor a negative 1 out of the denominator, and it's negative 1 times x minus 7. So those x minus 7s cancel, and I'm going to go ahead and say 3 divided by negative 1 is negative 3. And so now this becomes negative 3 times 3 plus x plus square root of x plus 2. Now, in this case, the denominator disappeared completely, we've got just a, basically a single fraction. So now when I plug in x is 7, this is a continuous function and things work out just nicely here. I put 7 in place of x, 7 plus 2 is 9, square root of 9 is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, 6 times negative 3 is negative 18, and we get our final result that the limit is negative 18. So this says that the point 7, negative 18 should be a hole in the graph. Let's graph that one. Uh, sure enough, right here at 7, we see a hole in the graph with a y value of, of negative 18. These are negative values here. The x-axis is uh, up here off screen somewhere. 7, negative 18. Okay, um, we'll look, come back for the next video with some other techniques.